Let's look at a specific example down here. All right, so this down here is the amino acid glutamate, glutamic acid. Notice it has an amine right here. Pyruvate, or pyruvic acid, has a carbonyl right here, all right? Double bond oxygen. This particular enzyme, which is called alanine transaminase, is going to take this carbonyl and put an amine there, and take this amine and put a carbonyl there. Let's see if this reaction actually did that. Well, notice over here I have glutamic acid, but instead it has a carbonyl now, and it turns out that molecule is called alpha ketoglutarate, which happens to be a TCA cycle intermediate. That's interesting. And then pyruvate had a carbonyl here. It doesn't have a carbonyl here anymore. It has an amine. So it turns out that hopefully what you can see, what a transaminase does is it interconverts amino acids and alpha keto acids. The alpha keto acids here are pyruvate and alpha ketoglutarate, and the amino acids are glutamate and alanine. So they interconvert them. Another way to think about it, and this is kind of the way structurally I like to think about them, is they take the amine from one molecule and move it and replace it with the carbonyl of another molecule. Okay. Um, mechanistically, that's not what they do exactly, but the net effect is that. An amine is substituted with a carbonyl, and a carbonyl is substituted with an amine. Now, one important thing about transaminase is that's kind of cool, is they have an equilibrium constant that's very close to 1, meaning the Gibbs free energy at equilibrium is about 0, which means that depending on um, which one of these sides has more on it, it will shift the reaction to go to the other direction, meaning uh, this reaction is one of the few examples that really is just dependent on Le Chatelier's principle. Okay, so in other words, if I have a situation where I have tons of pyruvate, then the reaction will probably shift to the right to produce alanine. If I have another situation where I have too much alanine, then I'll shift it to the left and produce pyruvate. Okay, so it's very dependent on Le Chatelier's principle because the equilibrium constant is very close to 1. All right. Another thing that's not indicated here but also kind of important is that transaminases are dependent on the cofactor pyridoxal phosphate. And that is a cofactor that is derived from vitamin B6, and we'll talk about that in much more detail in another video. All right. Now, right here, we're going to actually practice naming some products of transamination. So we're going to predict the products, assuming we have a transamination, for oxaloacetate, glyoxalate, glutamate, and tyrosine. And let's see if we can figure out kind of what happens. All right, so what was the first one? Oxaloacetate. All right, let me get the toolbox out. All right, so let's draw oxaloacetate. Oxaloacetate looks like this. And we want to just react it with a transaminase. So what would the product look like? Well, what we would probably, hopefully, expect is that this carbonyl is going to get replaced with an amine. So let's see if we can. Let me get my toolbox back. Uh, see if we can predict that product. So what I would get, again, the carboxyl stays the same. But I should get an amine right there. And then this. Now, what amino acid is that? Well, that is aspartate, abbreviated ASP. That's aspartate. So it turns out that if we have oxaloacetate and we react it with a transaminase, our product is just going to be aspartate. All right? What about glyoxalate? What is glyoxalate? We haven't talked about that yet, but glyoxalate looks like this. Glyoxalate is a product um, particularly found in plants that undergo photorespiration, which is for C3 plants mostly. And glyoxalate is also a problem in uh, the production of kidney stones in humans. So it's actually not good in humans. Um, but what would be the product of transamination with glyoxalate? Well, let's look at it. So here's the carbonyl. What would happen if I replace that or transaminate it with an amine? It would get, I would get this. And what is that? That's an amino acid. That's glycine. So it turns out if you transaminate glyoxalate, you get glycine. Okay. It turns out that if you eat too much glycine, you can actually produce some glyoxalate in some uh, small quantities, actually. All right. What about glutamate? Let's draw glutamate. So glutamate looks like this. So now we're starting with an amino acid. We want to see, again, what happens when we transaminate it. 
So let's transaminate glutamate. What happens? Well, here we're starting with the amine, so we want to basically take that and put a carbonyl in its place. Let's do that. So here is, again, kind of messy, but there is the carbonyl, and now I have this. Now, do you recognize this molecule? Well, it's one, two, three, four, five carbons. This is actually alpha ketoglutarate. That's a TCA cycle intermediate. So if we ever transaminate glutamate and make alpha ketoglutarate, this will go into the TCA cycle. Notice that oxaloacetate is also in the TCA cycle. We can actually pull that out and make aspartate. Okay, that's actually part of the biosynthesis of aspartate. The last one we want to look at is tyrosine. Let's look at that. So tyrosine, let's see. Let's do this. Tyrosine has this ring. Let's see. Again, we're starting with the amino acid. Okay. And what happens if we transaminate that? Well, we're just going to take this amine and put a carbonyl in its place. So what are we going to get? So we still have that, nothing changes there, but we get this. And it turns out this molecule is called parahydroxyphenylpyruvate, and this, it turns out, is actually in tyrosine catabolism. This is actually not in the biosynthetic pathway, and in any case, we don't actually do the biosynthesis of tyrosine. But if you were actually to look at the uh, catabolism for tyrosine, this would actually be the first enzyme in the pathway from tyrosine. It's actually called uh, tyrosine transaminase, and you get parahydroxyphenylpyruvate. So hopefully that little exercise helps you understand what a transaminase is doing. Okay? It's just taking an amine and replacing it with a carbonyl and vice versa. Okay? So hopefully that made sense. Make sure to like this video and subscribe for future videos. Um, in the next video, we're going to go over pyridoxal phosphate and then NADPH. Thanks for watching.